This is like my, I don't know how many consecutive years I've been doing this particular Money Show University, but it's great to see you all back. I think some of you have been here since you were, what, red-shirted freshmen? Uh, some of you are, what, on the six or seven year plan? I mean, um, but I've actually been coming here since UCF was uh, Owen 10. So nice job, you guys turned it around. Um, but I'm excited to come here because, uh, so, so I'm the second to last speaker. The last speaker is, is Victor Jones. And the fun thing about Victor, who's coming up after me, is that um, I met him when he was 22 years old. And he was your age, a lot of you, 21, 22. And, or he was 22 or 23. And now he's the CEO of a brand new company, which is going to change the world of finance. And so I just want, it's an inspiration. So you'll have some fun with it. Anyway. Again, I'm going to keep this um, short. It's quick. I put together a discussion today um, kind of talking about, uh, well, first, there must be something wrong with you if you're interested in finance to start with because, you know, we don't get a lot of kids that come out of school right now that go, man, I just love finance. But hopefully after today, I'm going to focus on, I'm going to give you 25 different things that I look for as somebody that hires people or tries to get people interested in finance or at least talks about finance with a lot of different university students all around the country. In fact, in, in I think another week or two, I have a discussion up at um, um, uh, up in Illinois. And we're ta I'm talking to Bradley University. And I try to go around to universities all around the country and talk about, hey, you know what? When I was 21 or 22 years old, just, talk, just thinking about, you know, what can I do in the world of finance and how do you break in? And obviously, it's something that interests you because that's why you're here. So. Um, I'm going to focus on a quick pass through of 25 different discussions or just different suggestions and ideas about what I would be looking for if you came to me looking for a job or you came to us with an idea, pitching an idea, and you were looking for capital. Because I think what's so, what's, um, what we miss sometimes is kind of what the people that hire people want to hear. Over the last, uh, let's say, 20, 30 years, we've prior probably hired a little over 1,000 people. And so I don't really sit through that many interviews anymore, but I meet everybody and I get a chance to see kind of, you know, what questions they ask, what their, you know, what their interests are, why, why finance turns them on. And I think if I throw some of that stuff out there, some of it will resonate, a couple of the ideas will stick with you. And at the very end, if you want a list of all 25 of these things, all you have to do is drop me an email and I'll send you off the, this PowerPoint presentation. So when starting a career in the, quote, money business. And again, the money business can mean lots of different things. I don't like to bucket it because that's not really fair to you. Um, because you can start out at a large financial firm and you can be networking yourself and then two years later you can become a trader. Or you can start out as a trader and two years later you're a technologist. You can start as a technologist and two years later, you know, you're in sales. So whatever it means, finance is just kind of all encompassing. But for starters, the single most important thing, and I think I tell this to you every year, is your ability to articulate something. Your ability to articulate something that you're not just passionate about, but that you have a lot of know-how. The, the practical and applicable personal experience that you've had, and I'll get into a little bit more detail what this is, but I like young adults. I like, you know, um, I like people that come to me looking for a career in finance that have had some experience with the products, with the industry, with, the, with, um, with just some of the theory, some of the content, it's all important. And then some foundational you know, STEM skills. Doesn't matter what that is. It's just something foundational, some language skills, you know, maybe some engineering skills, maybe something math, you know, just enough so that, man, you know what? you sound like you can put it all together. Given the challenge, you can put it all together. And so that's how, that's how for starters, that's just where I wanted to go with this, and then we'll take you through a bunch of things. So most importantly, when we talk to somebody, it's about gauging their ability to take risk, to appreciate risk, and to want to dive into something that's risky and make decisions around that risk taking. It's really easy to say, hey, I'm a risk taker. It's a very different thing to have actually done it before. So we're really looking for young people that appreciate risk. And not everybody does. Not everybody appreciates risk. There is, I think, 
it's really hard sometimes to land something in exactly what you, in a field that exactly what you want. And uh, I grew up in an era where it was the middle of a, it was kind of a nasty recession and, and high inflation. It was really hard to get a job in finance. And you know what? It's a lot of networking. It's a lot of resume saturation. It's a lot of aggressiveness. There's a woman I work with who's, um, who does a show on our network. And she said she called the same broker on the floor of the Chicago Board of, the Chicago Board of Trade every day for six months until finally he gave her an interview. I mean, that's kind of, you know, that's not necessarily a character trait of today's, you know, of today's millennial. And I hope that, you know, just appreciate the fact that it doesn't bother any of us. If you reach out to me 500 times, I don't care. I'll look at that as, hey, you know what, just being aggressive. Find industry leaders or find people within the industry that you either respect or that you might know, that you don't know, that you're interested in, that you find fascinating, that'll talk to you. There's a bunch of you in this audience that, um, that email me all the time. Not a lot, there's probably, I'd say about 15 or 20 people here that email me constantly and ask questions. I love that, I don't care, I'll talk to anybody. I mean, I'm a junkie, I'll sit out there for the next 12 hours and just talk about markets. But find somebody that'll talk to you that you can, that you can get information from and you can just kind of network with. The other day I met with somebody that, um, I'll keep the story short, but about, 30 years ago, kid walks in, he had, he had sandals on, I think sandals or sneakers. He didn't have any money, he didn't have anything, um, except he really wanted to be in, in the world of finance. And he came into our office, cold called us, and said, listen, I don't want any money, I don't want a job, I just want to sit here and learn everything I can about program trading. And we were like, who the hell ever says that? We weren't even really good at program trading. Like we were probably the worst firm in the entire Chicago derivatives marketplace on program trading. And he said, I just want to sit there and, and I, I just want to learn how to program trade. And for some reason his name stuck out because he had this stuck with me over the years because he had this really long Italian name. It just stuck with me. Well, so fast forward 25 years. 25 years later, I run across this company that's the largest futures trading firm in, in the world. He's the CEO. And I thought to myself, oh, this can't be the same person. So I reached out to him and hey, you know what? Same person, worth a billion dollars now. So crazy little, you know, things like that happen. So you never know. So find people that'll, that'll talk to you and you never know where that sticks. Start really small. It doesn't matter what the size of the company is. It doesn't matter what the pay is. You'll do it for nothing if you can. To be with the right person, to get in the right situation, to learn the right stuff, you, the cost of money to you right now is next to zero. So whatever it takes, m the size of company and amount of pay are completely irrelevant when you're learning. When we started in, when I started in this business, most kids your age, we took jobs as runners on the floor of one of the exchanges and we worked for $400 a month, $500 a month, $600 a month, whatever it was, couldn't even afford to pay bills, but worked for a ridiculously small amount of money just to break into the business. It is important to recognize the challenges that you currently face in academia. And I know there's a bunch of professors out here and I'm gonna be, you know, and I, I like having this discussion because it is very difficult sometimes to transition from academia, the world of theory and finance, to the world of practical finance. And so, and it's not on, just on academia to do that because it's hard to change curriculums. It's on you guys as well to recognize that. So. It's expensive to change curriculums, and so sometimes you need to learn outside the box. So how do you learn outside the box? You force yourself into situations where you can, where you have an opportunity to make decisions. Now again, you know what, this, this sounds like this is kind of some pretty general stuff, but when you're talking to somebody like me and you're looking for a job, or you're talking to anybody in the world of finance and you're looking for a job and you really want to break into the industry and somebody says, hey, you know what, you know, the first thing we look for is, can you articulate what you want? And can you articulate why you might be better than the next person? And then when you're doing all that, you know, do you like to take risk? And then can you articulate at that point what makes you different? Sometimes the missing piece in academia is relevant and disruptive industry experience. That means two people walk in a room, one person has some kind of experience. Hey, 
it, it may be it may be interning for somebody, it may be clerking for somebody, it may be writing research for somebody, it may just be writing computer programs for somebody. But whatever it is, whatever that experience is, wherever it is that's outside of kind of the norm, whatever it takes, that's what you want to do because that's what people look for. You know what? Markets move. And what made sense in 2002 might not necessarily make sense in, in 2020. And so what we're looking for is people that, that you know, can take that theory and can adjust it, can take the theory, the foundation that they've learned, all those foundational skills, and they can adjust it to kind of what they're looking for or what they can appreciate in 2020. That's a hard thing to do, it's not easy. Model and pricing efficiency have changed traditional investing. So a lot of what you think was the way we invested, and I'm gonna actually do a discussion on this tonight, but a, a lot of the things you think about, the way we invested in, in you know, 1980, 1990, 1970, 2010, it's not the same today. It's 2019, and now there's such pricing efficiency, there's such market structure efficiency, there's such model efficiency, and there's so much money chasing such small returns, the game has changed. Which means that as a participant, you need to understand that. You can't walk into an interview and say, hey, you know what, I'm a better technician than the next person, because you're not. You can't walk into an interview and say, hey, I'm a better fundamental analyst than the next person. You can't, because you're not. You can't walk into somewhere and say, hey, you know what, I'm a better cyclical analyst, because you're not. You can't say you've developed something technology-wise, you've written a better piece of software, because you can't. There's too much money chasing those returns. So what's happened is the efficient pricing model, the, the efficient pricing model of all the markets and the amount of money chasing returns has made it so that in today's world, if you are a, if you're just getting out of school and you're looking for real opportunity in the world of finance, you've got to be able to articulate your differentiator. So there's no edge and I kind of just said this, but there is no edge in fundamental and technical analysis. So don't go that way. Because if you came in to me and said, hey, I'm a better technician than the next person, you wouldn't get the job. If you came in to me and said, hey, you know what, I can analyze the balance sheet better than the next person, you wouldn't get the job. But if you came in to me and said, hey, you know what, I, can, I kind of can figure out based on expected move I can kind of convert implied volatility to expected move, and I can live within that range of expected move, and so that's how I understand markets. All of a sudden, our eyes light up, and we're like, okay, that's really interesting. Let's talk some more. Brains over bots. There is no artificial intelligence in a half a penny wide bid-ass differential. So when I first started out in this business, markets were very wide, and today, markets are very narrow. There's an incredible amount of money seeking returns. And because of that, markets are incredibly efficient and there's no edge. When there's no edge, some kind of computer system can't take the money out of that marketplace. Does that make sense? If there's edge, you can arb money out of it. If there's no edge, you can't arb money out. So one of the questions that we do, one of the trick questions we ask all the time, what is it, brains or bots? And if you answer bots, you don't get the job. <laughs> we're looking for brains because we're looking for people that understand it's not about building some kind of technology that is going to outperform the next piece of technology or that's that hundredth of a millisecond faster. It's about understanding the mechanics of how market structure works. It's about understanding the mechanics of strategy. It's about understanding the mechanics of underlying and it's appreciating that all underlyings are the same. Everything is basically priced the same way. Understanding liquidity and product indifference then is a rare skill. And if you walk in to me and say, hey, you know what, Tom? I am completely product indifferent. I don't care what I'm trading. I don't care if I'm trading the next presidential election. I don't care if I'm trading IBM. I don't care if I'm trading um, soybeans. It makes absolutely no difference because the pricing of the derivatives market is the same regardless. So up and down, up and down the stream, the entire d distribution of prices, it's exactly the same. This is something that's lost on a lot of people because it gets a lot of bad press. But HFT is high frequency trading. And high frequency trading is the most opportunistic and lucrative sector in all of finance today. It is rarely covered and it is always misunderstood. But the fact that there is high frequency is why there is so much efficiency in the markets. High frequency is just a, 
it's just a term that's been made up in the last couple of years. High frequency really means whoever has the best technology is what they call high frequency traders. Today's world of markets is dominated by high frequency technology because high frequency technology is, allows people to, to be the most efficient in their pricing, which allows more participants in the markets. You know, the stuff that we used to do, you can't do anymore because today the markets are priced so accurately that as a customer, you can do whatever you want. You can do whatever you want with about within a half a penny, one or two pennies. So because of that, and because of high frequency, if you can articulate why that's so special, that's where all the lucrative jobs are. If you come to Chicago and you're looking for, like if you're, if you're a young technologist and you're looking for a job in the, high, in, the, in the finance space and you decide to look at all of high frequency firms, they're gonna ask you, what language can you program? Or, what, or where's your data science degree? One of the two. They're not gonna ask you what you think about the markets and how you trade. One of the things that I encourage all young people to look at that are interested in the world of finance is some of the high frequency firms because there's been a huge swing over the last 10 years. Nobody cares about investment banking anymore. Nobody cares about hedge funds. People care about working for high frequency firms because that's where the money is made consistently. That's scalable, it's repeatable, and it's really interesting. It's kind of figuring out a way to take advantage of just min minuscule little amounts of edge or minuscule little amounts of mechanics to build wealth. The financial space isn't only about sales. It's about, also about education, and it's also about research. One of the things that we do, the biggest area of growth for us, in addition to technology, is research. So when you're sitting here thinking, you know what, hey, I'm not sure if, how much opportunity is gonna be out there for me in the area of finance, and if your math skills are strong, if your database skills are strong, and if you have some programming ability or some programming skills, there's opportunity for you in the research space in the world of finance. I'm going through these quick because we're on a real tight, uh, just a, a real tight time schedule. Investment banking is for people that have never traded, you know, or that have never strategized, that never really learned about market structure. Investment banking is more about sales. And what I think you guys really want to get into, I mean, listen, sales are fine. But what you really want to get into the world of finance is kind of the, the more you learn about the more you learn about market structure, the more you learn about product structure, the more you learn about strategies, and the more the, you learn about how markets work, I think the more valuable you become over a long period of time. Topics like volatility, topics like futures, topics like cash markets are rarely explained, but they're super important. They're super important. If you can explain how volatility works, and if you can explain what volatility actually equals as far as what we call expected move, then you know what? You have a leg up on everybody else. Make some trades. Don't be afraid to say that you love trading. I love when kids come in and they sit down for an interview and they, I say, do you trade? And I don't, care if it's, I don't care if it's one share of stock. I don't care if it's one option. I don't care if it's one future. I don't care if it's one Bitcoin. Or I mean, one fractional piece of a Bitcoin. I don't care if it's whatever it is, a Forex contract. It doesn't make any difference. Or a fractional piece of something. We say, do you trade? And the answer, if the answer is no, kind of scares me. If the answer is yes, awesome. Because if I say to some kid, do you gamble? Everybody says yes. So if I say, do you trade? I'd like to hear yes. <laughs> trade everything at least once. Say, hey, you know what? I traded a stock. I traded an option. I traded a future. I traded some digital currency. I'll trade whatever you want to trade. Size is irrelevant. Do you know today, this is kind of crazy, but, but after doing this for, for going on my fourth decade now, at this point, the, uh, the size of a trade to me is still pretty irrelevant. I don't care. It's all part of the game. It's all part of the emotion of what, of what you feel when you're doing something. It's all part of that, both that kind of that good feeling about that monetary fun and that good feeling about that emotional fun that comes from taking risk and comes from decision making. Talk about companies you like in the interview process. There's nothing wrong with that. If you go for an interview and say, hey, you know what? I saw this person talk at the Money Show University from some crazy company called Tasty Trade. I liked him. He was interesting. Or, or say, hey, you know what? I really like so-and-so from whatever company it is that you admire. 
I like that stuff. I like to hear that. I want to hear who you think is interesting. You know, you say, hey, you know what, I really like the guy that started Costco, or I like the person that started Southwest Airlines, or I really like the person that did this or that. I I'm interested in that. I want to know how your mind works. Don't be afraid to say who you like, and don't pick the firm you're interviewing with. <laughs> they won't appreciate that. But it will lend credibility to your know-how. Always remember, and this is important, always remember, it's just math. When it gets, when it really boils down to it, what, what is the true differentiator? It's just math. You know, we all think that there's something else to it, but it's just math. Everything is math. In order for markets to be efficient, it can't be anything but a huge math equation. So if I sit there and I say to you, because one of the questions we always say is, hey, what's the difference between person A and person B? And if you can articulate and just say, hey, you know what? It's just math. It's who understands the math. It's who understands the numbers. It's who can connect the dots. It's who can apply the logic and then repeat, it's just math. Because ultimately, how do you get efficient pricing? It's just math. So understand that expect, expected move is just based on something we call implied volatility. So you can tell the expected move of this cup of iced tea or this thing or whatever else it is just based on giving a high and low sides of a band, a price band. Just guesstimating that can create an implied volatility which will give you the expected move of any asset. The problem with it is there's not enough liquidity in this glass of iced tea or there's not enough liquidity in this clicker. But there is enough liquidity in the same few objects that a few people will trade or participate in. There's plenty of liquidity, for example, in soybeans. There's plenty of liquidity in IBM. There's plenty of liquidity in, in Bitcoin. So in that, for that reason, you can create an expected move for the underlying. If you understand that, that expected move is just a function of implied volatility. It's not a function of what somebody thinks. If there's somebody up here on stage at some point today and they sit here and they say, I think Bitcoin's going to, going to let's just say it's currently trading for um, $3,300 or $3,400. And they say, I think it's going to 20,000 again. Realistically, it's not over the next 12 months because Bitcoin implied volatility is less than 70% right now. So realistically, the expected move in Bitcoin over the next one year is less than $2,200. less than $2,200. If you can explain that to me, you're hired. But when you think about that for a second, very few people are taught that in theory, and very few people have a, a chance to apply that in practice. When I say very few, by the way, I'm talking about very few out of a few, out of 100 million. I'm not talking about very few from a bunch of people that are here on a Thursday afternoon and willing to learn this stuff. It's a high percentage of that. And that's the high percentage that go on to be successful in finance. Take any internship you can get, because it doesn't really matter. It's all networking. Take any internship in the world of finance that you can get, and it doesn't matter if you're paid or not paid or whatever else it is, you'll figure out a way to survive. Money's irrelevant at, at 19, 20, 21, 22, whatever it is. It's important that you get the experience. It's important that you get the networking. It's important that you make the connections. Know at least the basics of one computer language. We won't hire anybody anymore that can't. It's not about programming for us. It's about being able to make the work that you do repeatable. And it's being able to store the work that you do and allowing somebody else to use the work that you do so that we don't have to go back and do that work again. And in order to do that, you have to at least know one computer language. I mean, it could be, it doesn't have to be, again, you don't have to, you're not a, you're not a developer. You don't have to be an expert in it. It just helps us to reuse something. So whether it's Python or something else, I don't, we, we don't really care. Most firms today can use anything. Just as long as it's repeatable, that's what's important. You know, this is something that, that, that I think nobody really covers, but I, it's important to me. Don't say things that aren't statistically significant. I'm not sure anybody's ever said that to you before. Don't tell me things that are not statistically, um, that aren't statistically significant. Like if you're gonna make a case, if you're gonna make the case on why you're a strong candidate for a certain position, then articulate it with statistically significant data. Because what's happened is 
we've become a little more versed on data science. We've become a little more versed on kind of on, on what we're looking for. And we have to discount things that aren't statistically significant now because that's how we treat the markets in order to be successful. So what happens a lot of times is we'll get people that come in that'll say something to us because they think it's adding value, but it actually it detracts because it doesn't have statistical significance. And that's really important to me. Most important, don't be afraid to take calculated risks. And don't be afraid to articulate that you're comfortable taking calculated risk. Now, what's a calculated risk? Calculated risk is something like, don't say, don't say hey, you know what? I'm going to go out and buy 100 lottery tickets because it's a $400 million Powerball. A calculated risk is something that says, hey, you know what? This is, um, this, this stock is, I, th I think this stock is grossly oversold. It's completely subjective what, what you think. I think this stock is grossly oversold. So I'm gonna buy the stock and I'm gonna sell an out of the money call against that stock and I'm gonna do a covered call for the smallest amount I can do, maybe a couple hundred dollars total. And I'm gonna do that because I feel like that's a good calculated risk with a 67% probability of success. And when you say that to somebody, they're like, wow, that kid's on the ball. You know, you saw somebody earlier today. There was a guy up here, um, John Nigerian, right? And he was wearing a red beret. Were you here this morning with his story? Yeah. Did he tell you he copied me? No. Yeah, my, my head's bigger. No, his head's pretty big, too. The funny thing is that not funny that we're both wearing berets. You don't need to wear a beret to be successful or that kind of crap. But um, John and I started and at, at, the, at the same time, like 36 years ago, on the same floor in almost the same pit. And it's just how our lives have led completely separate paths. And we end up here on the same stage talking to you guys on the same day after you know, almost four decades, which is crazy, but, um, which I think is also cool. And because it's, it's important to us. Why is it important to us? Because you guys are the ones carrying the tor torch for the next generation. You guys are the ones that have to come up and we pass it on to you. You know, we pass this on and then you take over the world of finance. And I'm concerned because I feel like there's a certain bit of a lost generation or two generations due to all the passive investing out there. And I want to make people more active and I want to make people more strategic and I want to make people better decision makers and I want people to be better risk takers. And so that's what's important to me and that's why we're here. So I am right on schedule, and I am going to introduce to you like I, so thank you very much. Thanks for listening. If, if you just want those 25 ideas, if they'll help you, you can just send me an email at uh, Tom at Tasty Trade. I, I respond to my own emails. And if you want to be like an email pal, I do that too. Um, but, or if you want to come looking for a job, we do that too at different points. In fact, I think we just hired somebody that was at the show here last year. So I will, I'll con I can confirm that later, but I'm pretty sure we just hired somebody that I met last year that was a student that was at Money Show University that followed up with me and just joined, I guess he's joining our team as soon as he graduates in a um, uh, couple months, two months or something. So that's cool, right? <laughs>